Right, so uh, my name's Keith Moon. Um, I am an iOS developer, currently working with uh, BBC News. And what I want to talk to you today about is uh, iOS development and how you get started in it. Uh, perhaps you have an idea for an app. Perhaps you don't have an idea for an app, but you want to get into iOS development. You've heard it's the, the greatest thing since sliced bread. So we're going to go through some of that and uh, try and work out what you do next. And uh, there'll be a workshop later that, um, where we can actually do some coding. So one of the things I want to talk to you about this morning is why would you want to get into iOS development? Uh, what's great about the platform? Uh, what's great about being an iOS developer? Uh, why it's beneficial? Could it be a great career move? So we'll talk a bit about that. And we'll have a look at what you want to build in terms of an app, uh, what goes into an app, uh, what technologies you can use, what uh, elements of the platform you can take advantage of. And then finally, we'll look at how you go about doing that. So uh, what avenues you can look at, what tools you need to do native iOS development, uh, possibly what other options there might be. Maybe native iOS development isn't the right route for the thing you want to build. So we'll have a look at some of the other options. So as I said, uh, my name's Keith Moon. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. But if you Google for me, uh, you won't get me. You'll get this guy. So Keith Moon also happened to be a uh, drummer for The Who, big rock band. I'm not quite as rock and roll as him. Uh, I haven't thrown any TVs out of hotel windows. I haven't driven any Rolls Royces into swimming pools. I once got a little bit annoyed at a hotel inn, and I refused to fold the, uh, the towels properly. But apart from that, that's pretty much uh, as far as I go in terms of rock and roll. I No throwing TVs out the window, no. I, I, I respect technology too much to do that. Not going to happen. So that's not me. This is me. So uh, you can get me all these places. I sort of intentionally misspell my name because it helps separate me from that other guy. You don't want him, you want me. So LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, my blog. OK, so uh, why develop for iOS? What's, what's great about it? Well, uh, I used to be a civil servant. I've been developing iOS apps for about four years. Before that, I was a civil servant um, doing a regular office job. And had an idea for an app and decided to look into what would it would take to go about building it. Bought a book on iOS development, started working through it, and uh, then started getting, approaching by, uh, getting approached by other people to build iOS apps for them. Started doing that, ended up getting a job, and um, yeah, it's gone pretty good. Um, in actual fact, iOS development is a pretty good career move. So that's one reason to, uh, to build for iOS. Um, Actually, I, I mean, I, I love building. For, I love uh, building software. Um, I love the, the mobile device is, is um, a really personal device. It's something that sits in your pocket all day, and so building software for it means that you have the potential to affect people's lives uh, for the better every single day, or for the worse actually if you do it if you do it badly. Um, and the distribution platform that the App Store gives you means that you can one person on his own. Uh, with a Mac and an Xcode, can um, can run software on millions of devices in millions of people's pockets, affecting millions of people's lives. Now, I'm very fortunate that I currently work for BBC News, um, and the software that I write um, is used by millions of people daily. It helps them find out what's going on in the world, helps them keep up to date uh, with the country and the world around them, and I'm I, I, I'm really I'm really grateful for that, and I re really enjoy that. It is actually very financially rewarding as well. So, um, iOS development um, is uh, one of the most highly sought after technical skills around or development skills. Uh, this is from uh, a website called In 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 In. in uh, Indeed, yes, and they they collect together salaries for different uh, IT industries, different parts of the IT industry. And so this was uh, salaries. Uh, this is actually in the US, but it holds true for the UK as well. And 
IRS development is 13% higher salaries than uh, PHP developers, or some other equiv equivalent uh, developer. So in terms of salaries, it's very good. Uh, and it's not just uh, that it's uh, well paid, it's also actually growing as well. So it's highly in demand, still highly in demand. That demand is increasing, and so actually is the salary. So this is uh, from networkworlds.com, and it's uh, an analysis of net salary increases uh, from 2012 to 2013 across a whole load of um, IT um, sections. And mobile applications developer is actually sort of the top. It's increased about 9% year on year. So it's a uh, highly demand in demand skill. The demand is growing, and it's a really good career move if you're thinking of a career change. Um, that's all very well. You know, that's, that's great, pays very well. But maybe that's not what you're interested in. You have an idea for an app, and you want to get that app into as many hands as possible, into as many people as possible. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, there's kind of a bit of a, a platform war going on at the moment. iOS and Android, uh, both, uh, both are used by millions of people all over the world. Um, Android is certainly gaining in terms of uh, install base. There are many more people using Android than iOS now. It's overtaken. A lot of that use has come from uh, low-end handsets, and uh, uh, Android is now seen as the sort of default phone that you give someone. Rather than it be a feature phone, you go to your network provider and you want a free phone, you'll likely get an Android phone. That doesn't necessarily mean that those people are downloading apps uh, using mobile software and using the mobile internet. And actually, if you look at the actual usage of mobile OS, uh, mobile e OS iOS is still far ahead, uh, still far in the lead. So this is uh, some data gathered by net market share uh, for August 2013, so just recently. And iOS, uh, this is browser hits. Uh, so they're checking the... Uh, iOS version, uh, the OS version based on browser hits, and iOS is still far and away in the lead. So it doesn't really matter how many people have a particular phone of a different platform. The fact is iOS is dominating in terms of usage and therefore dominating in terms of app usage, and therefore that's the platform you want to target if you want to get your software in front of people's eyes. Uh, it's also, that's great, very, that's great, people are using it, but when it comes to making money, iOS actually is leading as well. The App Store, uh, the App Store distribution system and the ease of which that Apple make it to spend money through it means that uh, iOS users are 30% more likely to spend money than Android. They are 30% more likely to buy a paid for app to use an app purchase um, and this is something that Apple has been uh, really good at for a very long time uh, their iTunes pedigree the fact that people have been buying music from them for a very long time means that they have all these people's credit card details which means there's a lot less of a barrier to that payment process it's a one-click payment system um, it means that you write an app you want to get paid for it it's much more likely to happen on iOS than any other platform. So that's great, brilliant. We all love iOS. It's, it's a really good platform to develop for. OK, so we know we want to develop for iOS, uh, but what do we want to develop? Perhaps you have an idea for an app. Perhaps you know you want to build an app. You've got a vague idea, and, but you haven't quite crystallized it. You don't even know if it's possible. Now. A few hints and trips, uh, hints and tips. Uh, make it original. Don't you know? Don't go out and decide I'm going to build the next Angry Birds because you know what? So that's exactly what hundreds of other people have also said, and hundreds of other people are also trying to build the next Angry Birds. And so there's hundreds of Angry Birds clones out there. That's not what is going to get people interested. Come up with an original idea. Perhaps solve your own problem. If there is something, an app that doesn't exist that you want to exist, make it, create it, build it. Um, scratch your own itch. Um, perhaps there is a process that you have to do manually every day. 
And if it could be automated by an app, it would save you 30 seconds every day, maybe, maybe a minute every day. That is something that other people are going to be interested in as well. It's going to save you time. It's going to be of benefit to people. Uh, so those are the kind of things that you need to think about. What, can I, what problems can I solve? Um, how can I help people do stuff better? Those are the kind of apps that, that really work. Um, so perhaps you have an idea for an app, but you don't know if it's quite possible. You don't know if the platform supports the technology that you want to use. Perhaps you don't have an idea for an app and you, you want some sort of inspiration. You need to kind of come up with, with something. Well, one of the best ways to do this, I think, is, is to look back at the history of iOS, look at the functionality and the, the frameworks that have been added as time has moved on, and then we can sort of pick out with each successive uh, improvement in iOS, we've seen an explosion of a certain type of app or certain types of app categories as the technology has enabled uh, them to happen. So as we look forward, if we then start to look to what's coming next, perhaps we can predict what app categories are going to be ripe for exploitation uh, as iOS moves forward. So we start with when the iPhone first came out in 2007. Had no SDK, had no ability to write native apps apart from jailbroken apps. Uh, the only thing you could do and the thing that Apple suggested was to write web apps. So they made this great uh, HTML5 compliant uh, web browser, Mobile Safari. And they suggested that you use HTML web technologies to build the apps that you wanted. Uh, use HTML, CSS, JavaScript to create interactive uh, apps that, that, that did exactly what you wanted. Um, and that's great. Uh, however, it meant that there was limited access to the native uh, functions. Uh, some stuff worked. HTML5 has the uh, spec for things like location, so you can get you can get location positioning through a website. So that that's great. You can create kind of location-based at web apps, um, but access to the camera uh, wasn't available. Access to uh, gyroscope and, and and sort of positioning information wasn't available, and pretty much anything other than the basic type of stuff, basic utility apps like uh, tip calculators, uh, sort of some simple games and things that were just required sort of a, a wizard of steps, just, just basic information being presented. Um, and so these are the kind of things that you saw spring up when the first iPhone came out, uh, web apps that, that, that helped you solve a problem. Um, and that was where we were. Then uh, Apple started to realize, mainly because of the, the jailbreaking community, the fact that people really did want native apps and that the web apps just weren't going to cut it. So they released um, an SDK and iOS uh, 2.0. And with that came um, the App Store and the ability to create native apps, the ability to um, hook into the uh, device directly. So that brought uh, a definite improvement in terms of uh, performance and speed because you didn't have the browser acting as the intermediary. You were, you were executing direct code on the device. Uh, it meant that you had one-click purchasing through Apps, the App Store, so you could monetize your apps uh, a lot easier. You didn't have to build a website that took credit card details. You could actually you could devolve all that to to Apple and let them deal with that. And for uh, for that privilege, you had to put, give them thirty percent, and that's still the case now. So if you're building an app on the App Store and you it's a paid app or you have in-app purchases, you are giving thirty percent of that revenue to Apple. But they handle the processing. You simply sign up for a developer account, and you wait to get a uh, bank transfer every month or whenever you've earned enough money to make it worthwhile. Um, so some of the other features that came as part of this first SDK were OpenGLES, which uh, means that you can make uh, pretty sophisticated games. Uh, and there was a mobile games explosion. You know, we saw a, a, a lot of games. Uh, come out, um, and games that, that were written in OpenGL on other platforms could relatively easily be ported to um, to iPhone. And Cocoa Touch is the framework that uh, the iPhone uses. 
it is uh, the UI framework. It's, it's the things that you tend to see in most apps, things like tables, scrolling tables of, of, of information, uh, things like navigation controllers, which present a set of information, and then you tap something, and then more information slides on. All of that was made available to you now so that you could create your own apps based on that framework. So these are the types of things you saw. You saw people creating OpenGLES games, uh, utility apps, a lot of the stuff that uh, people were building in web apps, they now they could build natively, things like travel planners, social networking. So the Facebook app was there at launch for um, the first release of the SDK. So those are the sort of things, basic apps uh, that you saw. And fast apps, unfortunately. That was some, for some reason, that became a thing. Um, I don't know why. Luckily, it seems to have gone away now. Um, I don't know. So don't, don't make a fart app. We don't need any more of them. So another year rolls on. iOS 3. More capabilities released by Apple. More things that you can do with the SDK. So MapKit. You now you always had the ability to find out the position of the loca uh, position of the device. You knew the longitude and latitude of the device, but you weren't able to present that information on the map. Um, MapKit enabled you to embed a live, scrollable, zoomable map, much like Apple's uh, Maps app. So you could recreate the, that Maps functionality within your own app. So this was great for location-based apps. They could uh, take uh, you, they could. Uh, take your location and actually show you where it was in the context of what was around you. Um, core data. Core data is a uh, very powerful uh, object mapping framework. So iOS comes with a database, embedded database, uh, SQL Lite 3. And you could always use that before to, in order to persist your data, in order to save information between app restarts. Uh, but core data gave you an abstraction layer. It means that you could specify the objects that you want rather than worry about the database tables and the, the, the joins between the database tables. You could simply specify your objects, uh, specify the relationships between your objects, and core data would handle the rest. It would create the underlying database that backed that, and it would provide to you uh, objects that you could interact with, uh, you could put information into, and then save. Um, and when we get on to look at Xcode, we'll have a quick look at the what the the interface looks like for that. But basically, it's like uh, w when you are building a database, very often you will create a, an entity relationship diagram. You will um, look at your domain, and you will you'll create uh, objects that are connected, and then you will translate that into a into a database uh, schema. Well, now you don't have to do that second step. You just create your object relational mapping, and then you're done. That's all handled by core data. So it's really powerful framework. Uh, other thing that's released is push notifications. So now, um, this was Apple's attempt to get around the problem of not running in the background. So uh, by this point, Android was out. Android could run apps in the background, so you had you wanted apps to do things while you were you were busy. You want they wanted they you wanted them to check your mail. Uh, you wanted them to um, keep sniping on an eBay bid. Maybe um, you could do that on Android, but you couldn't on iPhone because as soon as you press the home button, the app was quit. There was no no code running in the background, and there was a very good reason for that. Uh, greatly improved battery life. Um, it, uh, it that was basically it. I mean, it. It prevented the draining of battery. If you've got code, if you've got a bad developer who's written some bad code and it's constantly doing some number crunching in the background, it's going to kill your battery. And that's what happened on Android. Ba uh, battery life on Android is pretty bad. So Apple's solution to this was push notifications. So you could have a service running somewhere else, uh, your own server, and you could push a message to uh, a device and give it some information and prompt the user to um, to s restart the app and get the information that they needed. Um, it's it was wasn't a it wasn't the perfect solution to the the background problem, but it was it was a start. Um, 
and uh, really helped messaging because you could essentially have a, an IM client that you could have a service running on, on your server that monitored the connection and then sent you a message when there was a, sent the device a message when there was a new message for you. Uh, other thing that, this in, um, uh, that uh, iOS 3 introduced was in-app purchases. So up until now, you even have the choice between a, three, a free app or a paid app. You, you, and you had no ability to have any demos. You, didn't, you weren't allowed time-based demos. You weren't allowed um, trials. So w essentially what you had to do is create possibly a light version of your app and then a paid version of your app. And the user would have to try the light version, either, either just take the jump and, buy and pay the money without really experiencing the, the software, or they would take the light version, the free version, use it for a bit, um, and then upgrade to the paid version later on. Really bad user experience. You end up with two apps on your phone. You have data in one app that you can't migrate to the other app. So it was a really bad user experience. Apple's solution was uh, for in-app purchases. So you can have a free app, um, and then you uh, offer in-app purchases, and the user pays uh, for a particular piece of functionality. And then once they, that pay, payment is verified, you can then unlock those features to them. So it, it unlocked the sort of the freemium model within uh, iPhone. This idea that you start off for free and then you gradually upgrade them and, and wheedle some more money out of them. So this led to uh, an explosion of uh, apps of different categories, location-based apps, um, things like Foursquare where you can uh, check into a particular location, become the mayor of that location, and uh, you know, see where you are on a leaderboard against your friends, about how many points you've uh, accrued. Um, messaging apps, things like um, IM, uh, cross IM uh, apps. What's this one? Beejive IM. So you could remain logged into Yahoo, uh, AOL, that sort of stuff. And you would get information, you would get notified of new messages via push notifications. And uh, freemium apps, lots of games took advantage of this. They'd have a free game. This is, I think, Smurf. Yeah, this is the Smurfs. This was, this was a real problem because it was targeted to children. Um, but the in-app purchases would be very expensive. And so you would find uh, parents would have huge bills um, for the in-app purchases that their kids were buying and not realizing. Um, Apple have pretty much addressed that now. But um, yeah, so in-app purchases helped uh, fuel that. So an iOS 4 comes around. Whole new stuff. Multitasking for the first time. So now you can have apps that, that do stuff in the background, but only apps of a certain type. Uh, there is a limited subset of, of apps that Apple will allow to run constantly in the background. And those boil down to uh, location-based apps, things like GPS, so sort of run tracking apps, that sort of thing. Um, VoIP apps, so Skype, things that need to maintain a persistent connection so that they can be triggered uh, when a call comes in. And something else. Uh, oh, sound apps, so uh, music apps. So if you've got a music player and you want it to run in the background so you can play the music. Those are the only things that, that Apple allows to consistently run in the background. You have to specify which one of them you are before you submit to the App Store. So there was limited multitasking now in iOS 4. Um, also, some other things, calendar access, access to the photos that you'd taken, uh, which obviously helped things like Instagram take off. You could, you could take a photo, but then you could also look at your, your photo roll uh, and use pre-taken photos. Game Center enabled um, you to challenge your friends to uh, specific challenges within games, also to do turn-by-turn -turn, uh, based games using Game Center. Local notifications came in, so they mimicked push notifications, but didn't require a server and could be triggered locally. So they are uh, useful for things like alarm clocks. So you could, from within your app, while the app's open, you can trigger a local notification at a specific date and time to happen. And then your app can close, it can be out of memory, it cannot be running, and the system will fire that local notification. It will look just like a push notification, and um, it can then prompt the user to open up, open up the app if necessary, or it could be some sort of an alarm. Um, and uh, Apple also introduced iAds, so they 
started to get into the, the ad game, uh, previously dominated by AdMob, which was bought by Google. They wanted a piece of that. They came up with their own, their own uh, ad infrastructure. Isn't really generally that used, but it's there. And AirPlay, which actually became, could become quite a big thing. So AirPlay enables you to beam video to another device, specifically an Apple TV. So now you can have apps like uh, iPlayer or, or, or yeah, iPlayer, um, where you are interacting with the content and choosing the content on your iPad, but the content is being sent to the TV. So this enabled uh, a whole bunch of new categories of apps, fitness tracking apps that could run in the background, things like um, yeah, RunKeeper or uh, app that I built called Audio Fuel. Um, it's a run tracking app. Um, it also gives you running music as well, um, a specific beats per minute to help you run faster. Uh, so you can put that in your pocket, turn the screen off, put it in the background, and it will continue to log the information, continue to log your progress and continues to give you feedback. Uh, VoIP apps like Skype, um, and music playing apps like Pandora, things that are um, playing music in the background while you're getting on with your day. So all of these things now were available, which, th which weren't before. So we're seeing that each time Apple brings a set of new technologies, a set of new frameworks, a whole new set of apps start to uh, spring up around them. iOS 5 introduced Newsstand, um, which was Apple's way of placating the uh, publishing industry. It enables apps to... Actually, this is one of the rare cases when Apple actually does allow some background processing. Um, Newsstand has some, very sp has some APIs that enable you to run stuff in the background and update and get the latest issue of a particular uh, magazine or um, newspaper um, at specific intervals in the day. So you could write an app that was, uh, you know, uh, was, which was a newspaper app, uh, and every morning you'd wake up, you'd open the app. You wouldn't have to have done any pre-downloading. You'd open up the app, and your newspaper would be ready for you. Auto-renewing subscri subscriptions. Um, and that enabled things like software as a service um, on, the on the platform. Uh, and actually, I use auto renewing subscriptions in the Audio Fuel app in order to um, subscribe to this music service that, that it has built in. Um, iCloud was also introduced, which is Apple's technology for providing a, um, a syncing service between all the devices that you own, all the Apple devices you own Mac, iPad, iPhone. Um, it's actually a combination of technologies. It's not just one thing. Um, it has a database syncing service, which can be flaky. It also has a more simplified um, key value store syncing service, which is a little bit more straightforward. Uh, but it enables uh, you to have companion apps on iPhone, iPad, and Mac, and them all to work seamlessly. So all of Apple's iWork apps, Keynote, um, numbers, pages, they all use iCloud, um, which means that uh, if you create a, a document on one of them, you can then just go to your, so you, you, you could start a, a keynote presentation on the train home on your iPad. You get home, you want to finish it off, you sit down at your Mac, start it up, and it's there, it's ready for you. Um, so there was an explosion of, of document editors that did just that. Uh, it's one called Cloud Outliner that I use. That's that's fantastic. It's on both. It's on phone, pad, and Mac, and I it just works seamlessly between them. So, next we had iOS six. iOS six had a bunch of technologies. Now, as an example of of Apple, just as Apple can give, they can also take away. Uh, iOS six saw the introduction of uh, a panorama feature on the built-in camera app, which instantly meant all of the panorama apps that existed were pretty much null and void. Not, you didn't need them anymore because you had the built-in one. So that is a, a bit of a warning, really, is that, that you've got to be careful that um, you don't build something that's so obvious 
that Apple aren't going to come around and eat your lunch. Uh, they aren't going to come around and go, you know, well, we can do that and we can do it better and it's built in. So uh, one of the other things they integrated was Passbook. Passbook is really interesting. It's it's an app which uh, enables you to, uh, it's an app which collects together um, tickets, coupons, uh, boarding passes, um, any thing that you need to sort of show someone or any um, ticketing type uh, thing. Where previously you'd have a ticket stub or you'd have uh, a boarding pass in on paper, people were starting to build apps that had them had them in. So all the airlines would have apps that that uh, enabled you to show the app to the check-in person, and they would be able to scan a barcode and uh, it would automate the process. Apple wanted to bring all that together centrally so that rather than have 20 different apps that had your um, store card, one that had your boarding pass, it would actually all be in one place. So that's what Passport was. Um, and it looks a bit like this. So you can get, this is from the Eventbrite app. So I have the Eventbrite app. I, I've signed up for an event. I can add to Passbook. And this gets put into my Passbook app. So Passbook is the one place I can go to to get all of the things I need, all the tickets, all of the stuff. Um, and the event organizers can scan this barcode and they can know that I've registered and stuff like that. Uh, as it happens, I wrote a book on it. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I don't know how that got in there. Uh, book on iOS uh, Passbook. So um, it, it's, a bit of a, uh, it's a bit of a pet project of mine. I, I quite like Passbook. Um, also, collection view. So, uh, as well as adding very user-facing features like Passbook, Apple also added uh, some developer-centric features like collection views. Collection views are like table views on steroids. They um, enable uh, the layout of data in very custom ways. So, uh, previously, if you wanted to have a sort of a sideways scrolling table view, so you wanted to scroll data sideways um, and you wanted to get to all the things, or the, um, the photo app. In the photo app, you have a grid of photos. That was actually quite difficult to do. Collection views makes it a lot easier. It basically uh, takes table views and makes them more generic. So instead of just having a single row of information going down, you can now have uh, information going in grids, information going sideways, um, information being collected together and then split apart again. Very flexible. So that is going to enable and is enabling some really dynamic layouts of, 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 of apps. Auto layout uh, was another developer-centric feature. It is sort of the, the, the future, really. Apple was starting to realize that they were suffering a little bit from the fragmentation that Android has. Uh, by this point, you have um, iPhone, non-Retina, so an iPhone 3, 3G and 3GS. You have an iPhone 4 and 4S that is Retina, so it has twice the resolution and twice, twice the width and twice the height in terms of pixel density. Um, you then also have the iPhone 5, which is the same width but slightly higher. So that's one, two, that's three different sort of pixel arrangements. You then also have the iPad, both retina and non-retina. So uh, the iPad mini is non-retina, the iPad 2 is non-retina, and the iPad 3 and the iPad 4 are retina. So you've now got like five different pixel size combinations. And it's all getting quite difficult to manage. Auto layout is the solution. Um, it is a declarative layout engine. So basically, you don't specify absolute positioning or sort of relative positioning anymore. You specify layout rules. So you say, I want this particular view to be 10, 10 pixels from the top and 10 pixels from the right. I want this next view to actually get its layout information from the first view. I want it to be 20 pixels from the first view. And that way, if the first view's content changes, if you put more information into it and it expands, the other view gets pushed over. Um, so uh, you can specify some really dynamic and really 
complex layouts using auto layout. So this, this enabled um, another explosion in, in, in apps. Uh, brand loyalty cards like uh, Starbucks. So the Starbucks card now, you can, um, you can your Starbucks loyalty card, you can uh, get as a passbook uh, card and it will automatically update uh, as your credit changes on your, on your uh, passbook card. Uh, events like Eventbrite, event uh, apps like Eventbrite, now you can get your event ticket as a passbook. Um, right, so that's, that's the history. Now we're at iOS 7. Now, obviously there's been some major UI changes. Um, the, the specific details of uh, iOS 7 are uh, under NDA. Obviously, I'm a developer, so I've seen a lot of the development docs, but I'm not at liberty to talk about them. So the only things I can really talk about are things that were announced in the keynote, things that were publicly made available. So clearly, there's been some huge UI changes to iOS, and this is going to impact everyone's apps thus far and everyone building apps uh, going forward. All of the standard UI components, all of the switches, all of the uh, navigation controls, all of that has changed, which also means all of the positioning has changed, which is why they've been telling us for the last year to use auto layout, because if we'd used auto layout, everything would have been fine. But I can talk about uh, stuff that was in the keynote. I can talk about some of the stuff that's known publicly. So this is from the keynote. So talk about some of the things that come up in iOS 7 that I think are exciting and that are going to help drive the next wave of apps. So if you are thinking of building an app, these are the types of things that uh, you can use as, as little triggers, you know? UI Dynamics. So uh, the SDK now has a built-in physics engine. So you, th there were third-party physics engines that you could, uh, you could include, but some of them costed. So, uh, some of them were, were a pain to, it, to integrate. And of course, they weren't natives. They weren't quite part of the system. UI Dynamics is, is part of the system. Uh, Apple use it in uh, certain places within iOS 7, not to build whole dynamic world, uh, whole physics world, not to build whole um, games, but simply to provide little touches to apps, just to make them feel like more of a joy to use. Things like as you scroll um, some information, rather than just be a static grid that scrolls, they flow. And as you stop, they kind of settle into place. And all that's driven by this physics engine. So those sorts of things I think we're going to see more and more of in apps. Um, Sprite Kit is a 2D um, game engine that Apple have built into, X, uh, built into iOS. So uh, much like uh, UI Dynamics, you could do it before. You could get a, uh, a third party uh, 2D engine like Cocos 2D. Um, but you have to integrate it, and, and it costed money. So now it's built in. So we might see a lot more 2D platformers, or we might a lot more hobbyists actually taking the plunge and making these 2D platform games. Um, iBeacons, I'm I'm really excited about. It's um, I don't know how much we made available, so I don't know how much I can say, but it will enable the uh, a device to know when it is approaching things when it's approaching other devices when it is approaching locations which are in which are correctly enabled um, and it's Apple's sort of answer to NFC they're not going to do NFC they don't want if you want to do a payment they don't want you to have to get your phone out attach it on a within like two centimeters of a, of a contact point and then wait and then your payment goes through they want the magical experience they want you to walk up to a shop they want, with your, your order, with your thing, they want the person behind the counter to know who you are because of your loyalty card um, and you to pay without even having to take your phone out of your pocket. And that's something that, that iBeacons can enable, and I think that's going to be really exciting. Uh, new multitasking APIs. So they've kind of finally solved multitasking. Um, there's a lot more scope for your app being woken up in the background of being able to execute code uh, when it had previously been killed. Um, and what this will mean, and, and, and this, what this will mean is that you can effectively have an app that feels like it's always up to date. Even if it's been in your pocket, even if you haven't launched the app in a day, 
you'll be able to take the app out of your pocket, open it up, and it will have the latest information. It will have your latest emails. Because Apple are, they're still respecting battery life, but they are being very clever and very selective about when they allow your, your app to function in the background. So it's very cool. Um, and it looks like Apple have, have added uh, some extra uh, another extra kind of sensor, which is always interesting, an inclinometer. So you always knew the uh, X, Y, the, the six-axis position of a phone, but you had to know the starting position in order to uh, determine where you were in relation to the horizontal. Uh, whereas now this is this will be available sort of built in. Um, so. That's some of the stuff that's coming in iOS 7. There's a whole load more stuff, but that's sort of the stuff that was in the keynote. That's the stuff we can talk about. So that's going to lead to a whole revolution of apps, I think. Uh, apps that are always up to date. You know, now when you take them out of the pocket, they'll have the latest information. Uh, effortless payment. New interaction patterns. Uh, things like UI Dynamics will enable um, interfaces that we haven't had up until now. Interfaces that are, that are interactive and that feel more fluid, feel more feel more dynamic. And uh, I think home automation is going to be a big thing. There's, there's a couple of things, iBeacons and um, peer-to-peer connectivity, which was actually on that previous slide, um, that I think is going to enable possibly uh, quite a few home automation opportunities for uh, iOS apps. Right, we're kind of running out of time, so I, I'm going to sort of push forward. So that is the what. That's hopefully given you uh, some ideas as to how you can, what you can build uh, for an iOS app, some of the frameworks that are available, some of the things that you can use, some of the tools you can use to create some great apps. But how do you do it? Okay. So um, there's a few options available to you. Native development, that's what I do. Build an iOS app natively using the SDK. Hybrid development, uh, using web technologies to produce apps. Uh, app builder templates, we'll go into that. And Hiring someone else to do it, getting an app studio to build it for you. You've got an idea, but you want someone else to do it. So we'll quickly just run through these options. So hybrid development basically means using web technologies that get interpreted into native code. Um, and then uh, that's, that's fine. That would just be a website. But the, the platforms, these, these hybrid platforms have new hooks, have new JavaScript hooks that give you access to native functionality. They give you access to uh, things in the hardware. Um, and a lot of them are cross-platform. So you could build on this uh, build once for both iOS and Android. The downside is that um, you're kind of limiting yourself right from the very beginning. You're taking all of the possibilities that the app world brings you, gives you, and you're saying, well, I can only use this subset that the hybrid platform has sort of is allowing me to use. Um, you're, you're working to the lowest common denominator. If you're supporting iOS and Android, you can only build on the things that are supported by both. So if there's something iOS specific, you can't really use it. Things like Passbook, it's not going to work. Um, and you have to wait for new features to impl be implemented. iOS 7 is going to be released probably in the next few weeks. These hybrid platforms won't be able to take advantage of any of the features until they actually go ahead and integrate them. So that said, for certain types of apps, for certain use cases, it's relevant. So there are a couple of platforms. Uh, the biggest ones being Titanium, uh, Accelerator Titanium and PhoneGap. They enable you to use web technologies, which a lot of people already have skills in, and produce native apps using these, um, using these systems. Some of them cost, so that's another downside. Right, another, op another option is an app builder template. So there are a couple of websites. I used to actually work for Mobile Roadie. Um, and what they are is it's a native app, but um, you use a web-based CMS to put your content in. You put in your photos, your videos, all that sort of stuff. And uh, it builds an app for you. The downside of that is, of course, you can't reinvent the wheel. You can only use the th technologies and the things that they have already integrated into their platform. So again, for certain apps, and if, if what you want to do fits within their template, that really helps you. And you can get an, you can app built in an hour. Um, but if you want to reinvent the wheel, if you want to create the next great app, that's not going to be it. That's more for sort of brands and uh, bands and sports teams and things who just want to promote themselves. Um, app Studio. You can go to an App Studio. You can give them a lot of money, and they will build it for you. That's another option. Right. 
but you've, you've thought about all those options and that's not what you want. You want to build it. You want to build it yourself. So I'll quickly run through this. Um, you've got to think about it first. You've got to plan, about, you've got to plan it first. Um, if you don't plan it, then if you don't fail, to, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Um, you should wireframe it. You should prototype it. You should think about the app before you write any code. Now, a couple of tools you can use to, to do that. This one's called Pentotype. It's got a video. It's not going to play the video. Um, that's all right. We don't have time anyway. Um, so Pentotype is a web-based tool that you can use on your iPad that enables you to basically draw on the screen, and it will automatically create these interactive wireframes. Uh, it's really cool. Um, so that's a tool you can use for very quick prototyping. Another one, there was a video here, but it's not working. It's called App Cooker. It is an app on the iPad that has its really powerful um, prototyping app that enables you to use all of the native elements, all of the native UI components to build and wire together your app. And then you can view that interactive prototype on an iPad or on an iPhone and see it, see it running live. Um, I'm doing a, a side project with a friend of mine, and he gave me the spec for the app as an app cooker uh, file. And it's fantastic, because I've got everything I need. I, I know how all the views fit together. I know how all the linkages happen. I know how things are presented. Really, really helpful. So that's a good uh, tip. But you, you want to do some native development. So Objective-C is the language that we use for native development. It's, uh, it's the language we use. It's common to uh, Mac OS development and iOS development. There's a lot of frameworks and, and, and functionality shared with OS X. So if you've done some iOS, OS X program and then you're going to be all right on the iOS, and actually iOS technologies is very portable to OS X. Um, Cocoa Touch is the uh, UI framework that is available on um, iOS, um, iOS. It's a sort of derivative of Cocoa, which is for, comes from the Mac OS sort of lineage. Um, and up until iOS 5, iOS 4 or 5? No, iOS 5, I think. Um, memory management was, was quite a pain in iOS development. Um, very different to web development. You have to be very aware of the memory you are allocating and the memory you are releasing. Um, because you are dealing at a lot lower level, you, are, um, you need to be aware of these things. Automatic reference counting, ARC, has alleviated a lot of these concerns. It's made uh, dealing with the mundanities of memory management on iOS a lot more straightforward. So that's a big benefit. Um, so this is Xcode. This is the development environment that's on. It's in the App Store. You can download it for free in the App Store. You can build to the simulator in the App Store. Uh, the only thing you can't do is build to device until you pay Apple a £60 a year fee and you get set up with all these certificates and stuff you need to actually build to the device. But you can build to the simulator today, now. Um, this is the development environment. Um, it has a really powerful debugger. This is the core data modeler. So I was talking earlier about core data. This is how you specify this sort of entity relationship diagram for your model. And it creates the database to back this. Uh, so you know, you're specifying your objects. You're specifying the relationship between them. And it does the rest for you. Really powerful. Um, storyboards are, are new um, in iOS 5. And they kind of do the same thing, but for your UI. They enable you to specify your UI in an almost a sort of what you see is what you get manner, link up your, your views, and take away a lot of code that you would have to write manually previously. Uh, it also gives you a great way of sort of visualizing the whole scope of your app and understanding how things move, uh, how a user travels through your app. So that that's, that's, uh, makes things really easier. Also built into Xcode and the, and the development environment are unit tests. Uh, something that used to be used to be a sort of third-party thing. Now it's built into Xcode. Um, UI automation testing is also built into Xcode. Uh, you can write uh, tests in JavaScript and they get executed. Uh, so you can specify the whole journey through your app. You can have it as part of your build process, and uh, it will run. Uh, it will automate 
your app, it will run through them. You can take screenshots at certain screens, and then you can sort of review the screenshots and check that everything is as you expect. Um, and there's a, a really powerful analyzer and profiler. So you can do some memory profiling. You can do um, time analysis, uh, time profiling. You, you can pretty much get all the information you need through this. So that's the, it all comes as part of Xcode. That all comes as part of your development environment that's available on OS X. Right, so that is um, why to develop on OS, uh, OS iOS, uh, what to develop, and how to develop. Now, um, I'm giving a, a, a talk, a workshop at 2 p.m. in workshop two, and we are going to build an app. The plan is we're going to build an app, which is sort of a now and next app. I work for the BBC. BBC have some open APIs. So we will build an app that will give you uh, what's going to be on all the BBC channels, what's on there now, and what will be on for the rest of the day. So hopefully, we're going to give that a go. We're going to try and build that in two hours. So if you're interested uh, and you want to learn a bit more about uh, iOS, you want to build your first app, then come along to that. The requirements are you're going to need a, um, a computer running Mac OS X. And you are going to need to have downloaded uh, Xcode from the Mac App Store. You got that? You're ready to go. And there you go. There's my contact details. I don't know if we've got a chance for any questions. Does anyone have just two questions? Does anyone have any questions? Where can we get the iOS seven? <laughs> so the rumor is it's going to be available on the 10th of September, so like day, literally days away. And what usually happens is th they're going to have an event. On th the rumor is they're going to have an event on the 10th of September. Uh, they will probably announce the uh, release candidate for iOS 7, which means that we could start submitting apps that take use of iOS 7. Within the next week or so, it will be available to the public, so you'll be able to update your phone to support iOS 7. Um, and then all of the developer tools will also update. You'll get the new X code, which will enable you to play with iOS 7. So unless you've signed up for the developer account, which you probably do for free, um, if you sign up for the developer account, you might have to pay 60 pounds, then you can get iOS 7 now. I've got it, it's on my phone. But um, other than that, you've only got to wait like a week or two. Anyone else? Oh, there's one right up the back. In terms of coding literacy, where would you suggest, like what type of, type of stuff do you need to know beforehand? And um, so it's, uh, Objective-C is an object-orientated uh, language. So any experience with object-orientated languages would be beneficial. Um, it certainly is a step up in, in, um, uh, in le a learning curve from web development. Um, but it's doable. Um, I mean, I always think that the best thing is to have a goal, you know, it, it, have an app that you want to build and then learn what you need to build that app. Um, it's, some people think that it is, it is, Objective-C is quite tough, tougher than, than some others, um, tougher than Java potentially. Um, it's got a lot easier. Things like um, the ARC, the automatic reference counting, I mean, you, you don't have to worry so much about memory anymore. Um, and some of the other developer tools, things like storyboarding, mean that you can write, you write less code. You can kind of connect more stuff visually. So I think that helps. So there is a learning curve. Um, it is more complicated than web development, but it's doable. Okay. Do I press it?